Hello, beautiful people, and welcome. Welcome back. We are here, and today we're going to be talking about toxic jobs. We're going to be talking about liberation, reclaiming our joy, um, and even dreams. So to get started, my name is Alicia Renice, and I'm so happy that you are here, but I'm also joined by two fellow beautiful women um, who are on a mission to help Black women get free. So if you could please introduce yourself, let us know what you're about, where you're from, anything you want to share with us, feel free. Yeah, I guess I'll go first. I'm a surprise. I am a Black woman social worker, um, healer, educator, co-host of the Job Liberation Virtual Summit for Black Women with Dr. Kamani. Um, originally from St. Louis, Missouri, moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, and then relocated to Guadalajara, Mexico, where I am now. Um, but yeah, I think that's about it. Yes, I love it. I'm so excited to be here today. So I'm Dr. Kamani. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. I'm originally from Chicago. I live in Los Angeles now, um, and I'm a proud Spelman alum. I want to make sure I say that. So licensed clinical psychologist, toxic job survivor, and more importantly, I'm a toxic job liberator for Black women. So with Marissa Price, we are launching the Job Liberation Virtual Summit for Black women. So excited about that. And I'm so excited for this conversation. So thank you, Alicia. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. I do I do want to ask you, Dr. Kimani, um, and I've been wanting to ask you this for a minute. You you are very proud of where you went to school. You're very oh, yeah. proud of. Can you can you talk tell us a little bit about that? Like why oh, it's so important God. to you? Okay. Yes. So you know when I grew up, I grew up in a suburb outside of Chicago, Oak Park, Illinois, and um, it wasn't. They they said they were very diverse and all those other kind of things, but I experienced so much racism, microaggressions, all those different things. You know where teachers wouldn't know my name or they wouldn't call on me or. Just, you know, or being like the only or few of the Black people in honors or AP classes. And it was such a horrible experience that I, I was like, I do not want this for college. So, you know, in terms of HBCU, I knew someone at Spelman. I went down there. I fell in love with it. And Spelman was is honestly one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life because it really affirmed me as a woman. It affirms why I'm doing this work, right? So the dedication to all of us as Black people and the liberation, but it grounded me in knowing my greatness to be around that many brilliant Black women, right? Speaking our truth, speaking our truth, right? And being encouraged to speak our truth. And guess what? Not being scared to know my worth, and to not allow others to treat me less than that, right? And then I just want to share, share this briefly. Our graduation speaker was Oprah Winfrey. And she said, um, in life, people might try to treat you like a slave girl, but you remember you're a queen girl. And I have remembered that since that day. Because when I was at that toxic job and they were trying to treat me like a slave girl, I was like, what? Like, what? what are you doing? Like, I know my worth. Okay. Like you are not doing nothing to me about this, but knowing that we are Queens. And so that's what I want black women to know. And that's why I love Spelman college. <laughs> I no, I appreciate that. I'm here for it. Um, you speak and with sisterhood. such I forgot to say yes. about sisterhood. Oh my mm -hmm. God. You know, just the power of black sisterhood. And, you know, it hurts me to hear so many black mm -hmm. women say, they don't trust other Black women or they've had issues with other Black women. And I understand I've had some negative experience with Black women also, but the vast majority of my experiences have been positive. And I want us to be able to connect our sisterhood because that uplifts us. It's like a mirror to us about what we are able to do. And we need to be able to support one another. I think, I think that's absolutely beautiful. Um, and it does speak to the I do understand. I have heard people say like, oh, you know, I don't have a lot of black women friends, but like to be completely honest with you, black women have always been in my corner. Black women, I have experienced some bad experiences before when I'm looking at the people who come to my rescue, the people mm -hmm. who are like, it, they're black women. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I'm, I'm here with you with the sisterhood and yes. caring for one another and freeing one another. Um, and Marissa, I, I do want to ask you, I want to ask you both, what does liberation mean and look like to both of you all? Oh, wow. Um, I think for me, it means like um, living life on your own terms. I think that's a, 
thing that just came to me, like I know Adelia says that all the time on her channel, right? But it really does. Like what feels good to you in centering your life around that, right? And realizing that you have the power to make that happen. Because a lot of us feel like we just have to like throw our hands up. It's like, well, whatever happens, happens. But you have agency to plan your life so that it feels liberating to you, whatever way that looks like for you. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you have the power to go after that. Mm -hmm. Reminding yourself of your power. Liberation. Yeah, yeah, That's I completely awesome. agree with that completely. I just want to add for me, it also is liberating yourself from things that rob you of your dreams and your joy and your sanity and your health, such as a toxic job. So as Marissa said, having the agency to know you are able to free yourself. I think a lot of times as Black people, we've been taught that we can't do certain things, that we have to stay in situations that are harming us. The liberation is saying, no, we don't. And I choose something else and channeling and watching what Harriet did. Sometimes we need to move in silence to liberation and to pull as many Black people with us as we're on that pathway to liberation. Ah, OK. You all are already like it's almost like you're foretelling what, where we're going um, in this in this conversation. And I love it. It's beautiful. Um, I do want to ask because. I also talk a lot about dreams, Black women dreams. And, and I feel like, this is my belief, a lot of Black women dream, right? And they dream so big and they dream of freedom and healing and liberation. And they dream of taking people with them, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to start with going back, going before going into school, what was your dream going into either psychology or social work or, you know, whatever it was for you? Like, what was, what was the vision that you saw for yourself? When I acquire this degree, I can X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. What did that look like? Well, I went into psychology because just seeing um, people around me and their struggles, um, seeing other Black people around me, and just, you know, knowing that those messages that were sent to us as Black people, they're not a reflection of who we are, those societal negative messages. And I would see that so much in terms of how sometimes we might respond in a certain way due to issues of internalized racism. So my you know, vision of going into psychology was, I want to help Black people address issues of internalized oppression and ways that impacts our functioning so that we can live on a higher level and that we are able to work together collectively and recognize what are those oppressive factors in society, historical, that have kept us divided. This is all social programming. It's all about social design. So for me, I'm like, okay, let's talk about what are these issues that's contributing to our division, our mental enslavement, and how do we liberate ourselves? So that was my initial vision for psychology. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. And yes, please, Marissa. Um, I know that, okay, you're, you're a social worker now, but was that your initial... Mm -hmm a uh, field of study when Dream. you first went in and like what happened to get you there? Um, yeah, so I majored in finance. So I was working in banking for like almost three years. And then I went to graduate school for social work, concentrating in economic development. Um, but yeah, my dream for that was um, to make a difference, to make a difference in my community. Because growing up in St. Louis, one of the most highly segregated cities in the U.S., seeing the racial disparities that existed um, every day driving to school, because um, I went to St. Louis University, which is like in the heart of St. Louis. So seeing like the, the patterns of segregation, racial segregation, um, and that really infuriated me, right? Every day driving past that, I'm like, something has to be done mm -hmm. about this. So that was kind of my initial um, dream in going into social work and then realizing that people are doing things behind the scenes, but there are powers in place, right? People in place upholding these systems so that they exist exactly as they are, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that was kind of realization that I had in social work, seeing um, the systems at play and me kind of being in a toxic job, being asked to like be at the forefront of a lot of these things that were keeping things mm -hmm. the same when my initial dream was to push back against it. So that was my dream kind of waking up to how things really function in the real world um, in the social work field. Yeah. I, I, first of all, thank you for sharing that, both of you for sharing yeah. that. I, I really appreciate you offering that perspective. Um, I know for me, so when I was in school, I studied deaf studies, so deaf culture, sign language, 
and it was a focus on human services, right? And so this is social work, this is psychology, this is this a myriad of things, um, mm -hmm. you know, occupational therapy. There are a lot of like different, there are a lot of different fields of study for people who care about people and the mm -hmm. well-being of yeah, all people and the accessi sure. accessibility mm -hmm. of all people. And a lot of people go into these professions wanting to change, wanting mm -hmm. to make change, right? Mm -hmm. And like you said, even for me, like I went in there and I realized like, oh, wow, like, we were sold a dream. <laughs> we were sold yeah, a dream in college. It's true. <laughs> yes. And you graduate and go into the real world and see like, oh, wow, like, no, too many people benefit from the oppression of these people. Mm -hmm. And so you're you're fighting an uphill mm -hmm. battle and you're probably underpaid, underfunded, undersupported, right? And so for me, I was just kind of like, I realized I can't be well and serve in this yeah. capacity, right? Mm -hmm. So before before we even get into the professional part, what was, mm -hmm. what was your experience like in college? Like, how did that, for both of you, like, how did that kind of shape either your worldview? I guess, like, for me, on some way, so, in some ways, I was sold a dream, but in some ways, I was very traumatized. Um, so I want to ask you all, as Black women coming up in, uh, in schooling to become mm -hmm. professionals, how mm -hmm. was that like for both of you? And what did you experience, good or bad? Yeah, um, I'll start. So as a Spelman alum, I had, there was so much poured into me. I had such confidence about my abilities and the ability to speak up and to be motivated by other Black women. I don't see Black women as competition. And so when I hear about other Black women, like competition or people might see them as competition, I can't relate to that because I see other Black women and I'm inspired by them. Like, oh, go girl. Oh, that's dope. Oh, that, that, you know, I need to step up my game. I love to see other Black women doing well because it helps all of us, right? So they, it, they poured so much into me. And that was the first time, Alicia, I think, that I really did not experience microaggressions and racism and all the kind. I have to worry about that at school, right? And so that was a good preparation for me so that as I went out in the world, I had this degree of psychological armoring, right? So I knew I was grounded in my greatness. I knew about how smart I was and am and, you know, my capabilities and what I can aspire to do and like all of these things. And, you know, it's just like when you go somewhere and people try to treat you, like I said, like a slave girl, you look at them like, do you know who I am? Right. And, and really knowing your worth and thank God for that. Because I do not know what would have happened to me in a toxic job if I was not grounded in that because that situation was designed to destroy me. And I refused to let it destroy me. I was like, I'm out of here. I'm going to resign because you guys are not validating my, uh, recognizing my word and you're trying to destroy me. This is not the place for me. So I think when you know your worth, just as I was poured into so much in college, I was like, no, I deserve better than this, and I'm going to get better than this. This is this is not it for me. Yes, thank you for sharing that. That is that is that is a beautiful experience and perspective. Unfortunately, that wasn't that wasn't really my my experience, but like I think that is it's so it's so important and and it's such a precious time, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you're being you're supposed to be being poured into, right? That's mm -hmm. that's what you're signing up to go to school for. Teach me your wisdom, teach me your ways mm -hmm. so that I can forge my own path and or use the tools that you give me to mm -hmm. to do good in the community, right? Yes. And and Marissa, I want to hear about your experience, maybe like the other side, <laughs> the other side of maybe not being supported um, as you should have been in college. I mean, but whatever your experience is. Yeah. Yeah, it was traumatizing. It was traumatizing. Um, so I went to a Catholic private university, um, which was a huge culture shock for me. Right. I had grown up in white spaces, but kind of middle class, lower class white spaces. So going to like private Catholic university where everything was so different. That was a culture shock. Um, and having no one really around me to guide me through that process, right? Having a lot of kids who were legacy students. Um, so their parents had went there, their grandparents had went there, and this was just like old hat for them. I'm a first generation college student. Um, so coming up against that, that was really difficult. Um, and then being in business and finance, being the only black finance major. So all in my classes, it was like mostly white boys, like all in my classes. Um, and then finding African-American studies, which I double majored in, um, and really having a traumatizing experience there too. 
um, with someone who I thought was my mentor who kind of abused that relationship. Um, so all around college was was very difficult for me. Um, but I love to hear Dr. Kambani's story because there is it brings me hope, right, that college doesn't have to be like that for everyone. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, I so I kind of had like the best of two worlds, right? Growing up, I grew up in PG County, Maryland. And in PG County, it's a very like black county. But going to college was a culture shock for me. And much like you talking about the legacies and like that was my first experience with racism, like mm -hmm. that, that I could see. Right. And so like you hear about it, you learn about it in school, but going to college and actually seeing like, oh, it's not just people calling you names. Right. Like it's a system like mm -hmm. there's a there's a system in place to prioritize some people over the other. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm grateful for that experience because I can now see like, oh, this is how this is how the world is like this is how the world works. But at the same time, it is heartbreaking and it did kind of destroy my confidence um, going into those professions. I had a professor who basically harassed me and bullied me. And so because of that experience, I was not empowered. I felt disempowered and I felt like, oh, I'm not equipped to do this to do this work. Um, so when you all when you all went into your you graduated, you know, you're on your way into like going into the profession. How was it like what was the what was the feeling that you all felt like? Was it like, yes, I can do this thing. This is going to be amazing. Were you nervous? Were you excited about the possibilities going into your past jobs? Like, what was that well, like? Well, I, I need to do a, a step back, right? Please, because please. Um, I experienced extreme racism the first time I went to graduate school. And so that was traumatizing, right? So coming from a very positive experience at Spelman, ended up in a graduate program, um, a master's PhD program in clinical psychology, in a large metropolitan university in the South, I won't name the university, um, but there weren't that many black people in my program. And it was one day, there was a class, I think it was like intro to behavioral therapy or something like that. And so after the class, the professor said, I wanna see you guys after class. So it was three of us, three black women, right? So we go to this office and he says, um, black people usually fail this class. So I'm going to make it mandatory that you guys come in once a week for a tutorial session, right? So we're all young graduate students. You got the power differential, right? Like we're like, what's going on? So we try to seek support from the black male faculty member. And he, his response was, oh, he was just joking. That's my friend. That's my friend, right? So then we start going to other people within the department my so-called advisor was like, oh, he's just trying to be helpful, right? So when that happens to you, the trauma of that, right? And then we did go to the first session and it was like an oral exam. So he's like quizzy, like testing us on it, right? And I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. And so we eventually filed a racial complaint, okay? Filed a racial complaint. But by that point, things had disintegrated so bad. I was like, I cannot... I cannot stay here, right? It was so many bad things that happened. I can't stay here. So I had to eventually leave, but that was traumatizing to think that you go through so much to get into a graduate program. I'm in the graduate program. This racial incident happened, no faculty support at all. And just that feeling that there's something wrong with you. So I had to leave that program and apply to a whole nother graduate program. But that graduate program was good, okay? So I met my mentor um, and so many other powerful people where I really learned about psychology, clinical psychology within a social historical framework. So that worked out to my advantage, but I still had that lingering trauma. And only, I would say maybe a few years ago, I actually talked to someone and they said, what, what program did you go to? And I told them, they were like, do you know they have such a bad reputation with black students? Did you know that? Like, they, I think somebody's going to file a lawsuit. And I was like, oh my God, like that, I needed that because all those years I'm thinking, what's wrong with me? Why couldn't I make it there? Why did I leave there? You know, that, that sense that I was less than or whatever. Right. And it really started to shatter my, my confidence on some level, but then I went to a different graduate program. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate you sharing that. And oh, sorry. Also appreciate you sharing that perspective. And also you, how long have you been in practice now? 20 years. 
20 years and you're talking about something you spoke about three years. That's exciting. Yes, that is. That is exciting. But you you talked about this trauma. You said that um, three years ago, you said you talked about this trauma with someone and they and they kind of affirmed for you like, no, that it's not you. Right. Yeah. And yeah. it really speaks to how these tra traumatic situations stick with you. Yeah. Right. Like yes. for years. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. much like you, I had a, I had a teacher experience like that. The bully teacher, basically, it wasn't until I went to a different school mm -hmm. um, that I spoke to a different professor who works in the same field as her. And she basically confirmed for me like, no, yeah, she was racist. Like, mm -hmm. it wasn't you. And that was so empowering for me, mm -hmm. right? Because when I was asking for help at the school, there was no help. Like, yeah. and so you, like you're talking about that power structure. I am a student. I am a lowly student trying to appeal to a professor and mm -hmm. like the, the, uh, the dean of the school and these kind mm -hmm. who am I, right? Mm -hmm. Just this black girl who's causing trouble to them. Like I'm making mm -hmm. their lives inconvenient. Right. But I love that you advocated for yourself, even if you didn't get what you needed from that one place. I, I admire that yeah. because a lot of us stay too long. And we're going to talk mm -hmm. about that too. So a lot of us mm -hmm. stay too long mm -hmm. in situations that are harmful for us because mm -hmm. either we think, Oh, I have to muscle through. I have to mm -hmm. keep pushing. Like, this is what adults do. That's what I kept telling mm -hmm. myself in college. Like, I can't quit. If I quit, then I'm going to be a failure, right? Mm -hmm. If I quit, my my parents are going to be disappointed in me, whatever whatever the reason was. Um, but mm -hmm. I love that you advocated for yourself and you said, no mas. <laughs> like, we're not doing mm -hmm. this. We're going to go and do something else somewhere else in a, in a safer environment. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you. Let me just say too that Please. I think even at that, that much younger age, I was like, wait a minute, I'm in a psychology program and they are messing with my psyche, <laughs> right? Like, I can't, I can't stay here. And I love that. I can't. And, and a part of me is wondering, like, if it is because you had like such a beautiful outpouring for you in the beginning at Spellman, right? With, with other women who like reflect to you, like you said, like, no, you're amazing. Do you yeah. know who you are? Don't let nobody treat yeah. you like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where in, in a lot of PWIs, like predominantly white institutions, it's mm -hmm. a very much like the opposite thing. Like, be grateful to be here, right? Mm -hmm. Be grateful to be heard and to be seen, mm -hmm. um, you know? So so I appreciate that perspective. I really do. I really do. Um, okay. So going into your profession, um, both of you all are toxic job survivors. And so mm -hmm. speaking about those toxic jobs, when you went in, I'm imagining bright eye and bushy tail, like I'm about to make a difference. Um, yes. At what point were you like, huh, this might not be, <laughs> this not, this might not be for me, or this, this might be harder than I thought it was, or I might not like it here specifically. So going from you being inspired to like, mm -hmm. yes, let's, let's do this thing to at some point having your, and I hate to say it like this, but having like your fire dimmed a little bit, like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Like maybe it's not like that. Was that a similar experience that y'all had or no? Yeah, I think for me it was the the second role I took on. So I came into the job initially doing a role, which I really liked, like the team I was on and everything like that. And then 2020 happened and I was asked to take on an additional role in DEI, essentially leading a racial equity strategy right out of graduate school um, for a major bank. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was a red flag going in and then having to teach people about issues because of my background in black studies, right? Having to teach them at such a, an elementary level, a lot of the times that was a lot of labor on me. And I wasn't being paid for that additional role for I think nine months. And I had to push for that. Um, so that was kind of the turning point when I realized, hold on, something, something's not right. And that eventually led me to experience depression, right? Because I had been gaslighting myself about what I was experiencing in this job because this was supposed to be my dream job. Mm -hmm. right out of graduate school because it perfectly aligned with the skill set that I had and the education that I had, but having to have that like real moment with myself that this is harming me. Mm -hmm. and it was only through therapy and connecting with other people in Dr. Kamani's chat that I realized what was happening to me. I was in a toxic job and this is not right. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I appreciate you sharing that. That it that it also took somebody else like to reflect back to you, yeah. right? Like, actually, mm -hmm. this job is this job is probably toxic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this because uh, like I I really do believe yeah. black women specifically, but women in general are kind of primed to endure suffering. Like we're kind of expected yes. to 
indoor suffering, even looking at a lot of the professions that are kind of like the, the human services field, right? Mm -hmm. There, it's heavily woman. Like a, a mm -hmm. lot of the, a lot of like the hands-on part, like the actual doing yeah. the parts, are, are heavily women. Sometimes they're led by men. Um, but these, these, it's almost like we're taught like, oh, your suffering is good because it's for this greater outcome at the yeah. end, right? Like mm -hmm. it's for the greater good. So you should, you should stick in there and stick it out. But having mm -hmm. somebody reflect to you, like you don't have to suffer to make a paycheck, right? Like <laughs> you don't have to like almost die, like literally. And I'm, this is no hyperbole. Like you don't have yeah, to almost right. die to get paid. Mm -hmm. So shout out to that. Um, shout out to your therapist because that's like, that's yeah. a lifesaver for real. It <laughs> for is. Can I say just yeah. like in DEI roles, right? We're put into these roles. We're asked mm -hmm. to take on these responsibilities, lead these employee groups as Black women a lot. And that's extra labor. Mm -hmm. We're not compensated for. And like you said, we're supposed to wear it as a badge of honor. Thank you mm -hmm. for suffering, for teaching other people about these issues. Like, no, I'm not doing that anymore. Right? Mm -hmm. When I think there's like a time turning where we're starting to realize like, no, that's additional labor that you're not paying me for. Plus, mm -hmm. it's draining me mm -hmm. at the same time having to teach people about these issues that they should be teaching themselves about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Exploitation of labor. And it just made me think when you were talking, Marissa, about um, James Baldwin, I'm not your Negro. Like, mm -hmm. we're at a certain point where, no, I'm not going to, you're not going to exploit me. You're not going to have me, like, just parade me out here. And most of the time, these DEI things are gestures. They're not true transformative work. And many of us have been brought into these situations to do this so-called work, but we clearly find out that there's no true investment in it. There's no levels of accountability. There's no changes in policy, procedures, systems, nothing, right? And so it's kind of like taking a blanket off, like this is a sham. This whole thing is a sham. That's what it is. Right? It's a sham. <laughs> and I'm not going to be a part of this game. No, mm -mm. not doing it. Not doing it. You know, and Alicia, when you said that about going into your profession, um, I just want to talk a little bit about it wasn't necessarily when I became a psychologist, I experienced from the beginning a lot of racism. So a, a lot of disbelief that I was a psychologist. So people questioning, you know, are you really a psychologist? I went to an African-American mental health conference in Los Angeles, right? African-American mental health conference. I'm going in to sign in. They have all the different signs on the um, wall about, you know, psychologist, social worker, MFT, psychiatrist. So I go to the psychologist area. There's an, a man there who doesn't look like us. And I said, I'm here to sign in for, you know, to get my continue education credits. And he said, this is for psychologists. And I said, I know I am a psychologist. He said it two more times, right? Two more times. This was a pattern for me though. This was not anything new, right? So I'm thinking, okay, let me just hurry up, sign in because I need to get to the conference, whatever, right? At the end of the day, when I'm going to sign out, same room, same signs, go to sign out. There's a woman there who doesn't look like us. She did the same thing to me. She asked me three different times if I was a psychologist, okay? So that has happened to me. So as I went to that toxic job, that wasn't so surprising to me, right? And when I was initially hired as a clinical psychologist for a school district, when I was initially hired, it was great. It was a, a fantastic job. I had two Black women supervisors who are still my friends now. Amazing, amazing experience for a number of years. And then when they retired, I knew that I was in trouble. And that was true. I was in trouble because there was nobody really there to really support me and to protect me. Um, well, maybe they were there to support me, but they couldn't really protect me. And just a number of things were happening over and over and over again. And just that sense of trying to put you in your place, um, not acknowledging your credentials, um, at a certain point, I was asked to do certain things, put in leadership positions, never had a negative job evaluation, all these things, initiating and co-creating trainings that had never been done about racial trauma because my unit, which is the mental health unit, had nothing about racial trauma. So we're seeing Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, like Breonna Taylor. Like, so all these things happen. It's the mental health unit within a school district, not a peep 
about racial trauma. It's not a peep, right? So I was like, okay, we need to do this. I'm outraged about this. So we need to do something about it. So I had a vision for it. I reached out to a Black woman co-worker. We developed a training and trained the whole district, right, on our own. But our unit didn't support it. You know why? Because I was pulled into the office. Um, and again, the unit that is supporting the mental health of children did not support our, our training because the director told me, the director at the time told me, the reason we're not supporting this training is that you present it as if it's your training. What? What? Really? Okay. So, <laughs> so not only do you not care about the kids, that's, that's clear, right? We have something that people are responding to throughout the district. They're saying, we need this. We need this mandatory. We need this. We need this. You're telling me that you're not going to support this training because I presented as if it's my training, which it really was, right? You know, but whatever. And I, you know, had the Black woman come in and help me out. But still that. And then even though I've done all these things, right, pulled in, especially 2020, pulled in, do all the other things. I was demoted without any real reason, right? But guess what? I still took it. I still lied to myself. And I was like, oh, I got this. I got this because I'm fighting for Black students. They used to call me the Harriet Tubman at the job. That's what they used to call me, right? Because I felt like I had to fight for Black students and families and staff because in the air, I'm in Los Angeles, so the Black population is not too large, right? So I felt like I had to be the advocate so I said, okay, they demoted me. That's okay. I'm still going to do what I can to, to support Black students. But it just got more and more and more and more ridiculous to the point I had to take a leave of absence because it was so disrespectful. And guess what? I had been a very vocal advocate for Black students, right? When money came into the district for Black students, earmarked specifically for Black students, they told me, you can have no involvement in this program at all, at all, right? Even though I had developed stuff and did a living experience, you can't have any. But then they're telling the people in the, the Black program, oh, yeah, Kamani's going to be doing all your trainings. So they're telling them that. They're coming back to me. Oh, we're looking forward to you guys. you doing these trainings. And I'm saying, wait a minute. What's going on here? So it was like a complete shutdown, right? A complete shutdown. And, you know, Marissa and I both talk about pets a threat. That's absolutely what happened to me. So pets a threat, if your viewers don't know about it, pets a threat came from three Black women researchers, Dr. Juanita Johnson Bailey, Dr. Keisha Thomas, Dr. Rosemary Phelps. When a Black woman is sought out for her outstanding abilities in the workplace, and then she's a pet. Oh, we love her, right? DEI stuff, right? I was brought in DEI. Oh, we love her. Oh, what do you want to do? Right? And then she starts getting more attention and there's a shift in terms of how she's seen and treated as a threat. That is exactly what happened to me. And then it, it up. So when they demoted me and they did all these other things to me, um, I experienced what I call psychological lynching. So it was a situation where they were trying to humiliate me and put me in my place but they also were making an example out of me, right? So you see what happens if you if you speak too much, right? So that's a toxic system that controls other people and puts other people in place by retaliation. So that's what happened to me. But it got to a point, like I said, Alicia, I was like, first of all, I did not work this hard to be here and to be treated like this. I know my worth. I don't respect these people who are doing these things to me. And guess what? They're not even letting me do the work. So I'm fighting to do the work, which they're not even allowing me to do. So I was like, I got to go. I got to go. I I really appreciate you sharing this. Um, because again, you're giving us language that we like there are certain things that we experience and we feel, but we don't have the way that the way that either racism or these power dynamics work it works in a way yes exactly somebody says yes that um yes. metabolic maven hello dr kimani exposed a toxic system exactly exactly and that's a threat right that's a threat to them and their system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um how dare i how dare you right mm -hmm. um and and i think 
I think about how many people, again, either don't feel empowered to say anything or to or to say like, no, thank you. That's enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about how your life may have been different had you stayed. Right. Because, oh, my God. Yeah. So Ooh. how do you think that your life would for both of you all? How do you think your life would look now had you stayed in a, in a job that was toxic and harmful? Honestly, Alicia, I don't know if I will be here. OK, so um, I just started experiencing so many physical and psychological symptoms. Um, my blood pressure was going up. Um, I had these really bad nosebleeds and I never had nosebleeds ever in my life. Right. Really bad nosebleeds, difficulty sleeping, dreading waking up, profound sadness, profound anxiety, becoming almost like a different person where my family was worried about me. Like, we don't even want you there anymore. Like, how do you leave? Um, and just questioning if I even want to be a psychologist anymore. Because I was like, if this is what it is, I don't want any parts of that. And having a Black woman therapist and being able to mirror and, and tell her what was happening. And she was able to reality test with me. And she was saying to me, God is trying to get you out of there. Right? God is, this is a rescue mission from God because you deserve something bigger and better. Your message needs to be on a higher platform. I didn't see it at the time. I didn't see it at the time, right? So I have my therapist, I have my family, I had close sister friends and they were like, you have to go. You have to go, right? And even though all these things were happening, I was still, right? My, I'm crying. I'm, all, I'm still going to try to go. I'm still trying to stay. But then one day I'm in the shower and I heard the voice of God say to me, if you stay at that job, it's a death sentence. I got out the shower and I resigned immediately, right? Immediately. And when I resigned, I said, I'm resigning because of this job is causing me distress because of the workplace trauma and the bullying and all that. And then I left. But it's it was a very difficult process, right? So I was in a leave of absence for a whole year. I needed to get my money together because then become the finances. Oh my God, how am I gonna make money? How am I gonna do that? Even though I was a whole licensed clinical psychologist before I even start the job, right? But still, in our minds as black women, we think, oh, this is the only place where I can get money. That is not true. That is not true. But I had to work through all of that. I had to work with a financial psychologist. Dr. Roche Brown, who is one of our speakers at the Job Liberation Virtual Summit, I worked with her to get my money right. So I had the confidence to go. But the thing too, Alicia, what scared me was that at that job, I saw Black women who are not that much older than me dying and, and, and developing, you know, cancer, heart attacks, strokes. And I was saying to myself, you know, I'm dedicated to the work. I'm a hard worker but I love myself. I love my family. I love God <laughs> way too much for me to die at this job, trying to fight deeply incompetent and insecure people who are trying to project their incompetence and insecurity on me. I'm not receiving that. I'm not receiving that. So I need to pivot and go because I love myself too much. I love myself too much. I'm just gonna write that down, but yes. yes. A word for the people. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Kimani. Thank you. Um, Marissa, please, if you would like to share. Yeah. Um, so I actually went back to the job I was in. So I took a sabbatical for 11 weeks um, using FMLA, um, which was unpaid in the state that I was in. I know some states FMLA is paid, um, but I was in North Carolina at the time. So that was unpaid 11 weeks. But I did get the chance to travel outside the U.S. for the first time. And that was life changing. Right. Having people that were not like antagonistic towards me everywhere I went and actually friendly and welcoming. I'm like, OK, it's not me. So I kind of had that proof to go forward. But, yeah, I ended up going back um, to the job for six months after that. And that was the time I was in the garden, um, your community kind of working through what I was going through. Right. The severe like physical symptoms of not having an appetite, um, not being able to sleep, which is one of the sessions that we're going to have at the summit. Um, how to heal from insomnia, which affects a lot of us in toxic jobs, like the constant rumination. Mm -hmm. Somebody may be disrespecting you and now you're replaying it over and over as you're trying mm -hmm. to relax. Mm -hmm. Like, I know they didn't say that to me, right? <laughs> because that disrespect goes so deep 
right? Mm -hmm. It really cuts us to our core. Um, so if I had stayed there, I feel like I would be in such a, a dark place, yeah, in such a dark place, in even deeper depression mm -hmm. than I was in. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was horrible. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, thank you both for being vulnerable and sharing that. Um, I, I too, I had to go on FMLA for my depression um, and I didn't realize that my job was a trigger for my depression. Mm. I, I had no idea. Like I was like, what's basically I had thoughts of like, what's wrong with me? Everything mm -hmm. should be fine. I have a job, I'm employed, like mm -hmm. everything's fine. And it wasn't until I started having back problems, like mm -hmm. my lower back, when mm -hmm. I, like I would lay in bed and sob because I could Ooh. not move. Like my lower back hurt when I laid down and hurt when I woke up and it wasn't the bed. It wasn't my positioning or anything. I realized now it was stress. Like I was, mm. you know, when I'm stressed out, I'm holding my body very tense all the time mm -hmm. when I'm at a job and I feel like I'm being uh, hurt, not harassed, but like, like the overseer, right. That they're mm. always watching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like a presentation. Like, yeah. Yes. Like a plant. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And, mm -hmm. and I felt I had no time to really just like be human. I was always like, like this, and it was wearing on my body. And so I had to go mm -hmm. to a chiropractor. I went to physical therapy first, it didn't work. They did an mm -hmm. MRI, they couldn't find anything. Like, and I'm like, I know I'm not making it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I'm not making up this pain. Um, I got the MRI done, they couldn't find anything. So then they sent me to PT and just saying like, oh, it's because you're not exercising enough. I was going to the gym, I was walking, like I'm doing, I'm trying to do, you know, the best mm -hmm. that I can. Um, mm -hmm. Then I went to the chiropractor and she looked at my x-rays and said, it looks like you've been like jumping up and down, like, traumatically on your spine. Like your spine wow. is ridiculous. And I'm like, that don't make no sense to me because I haven't experienced any like physical trauma, right? Like I haven't, I haven't been in a car accident. Mm -hmm. I haven't fell that I know of, right? Mm -hmm. But it was because that job was stressing mm -hmm. me out so much. My body was attacking itself. Wow. And, and I think it's, and I, and I'm grateful because after I got married, I quit my job. I was able to quit my job. So shout out to my husband. But like, I like, because he saw what, an awful place I was in. And I felt like, but this is what adults do. Like I have mm -hmm. to adult. I'm mm -hmm. afraid of not making money. I'm mm -hmm. afraid of being seen as a failure. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid of being unhoused and having mm -hmm. to move back. You know, no, at the time I was still living with my mother. <laughs> like I was afraid of like not having anything coming in. I had, um, I had a bout of unemployment before and I had like my car repossessed and put on uh, food, food stamps and uh, unemployment mm -hmm. and the shame that I felt. Mm -hmm. Right. I didn't I didn't want to feel that shame again. And so mm -hmm. I was trying so hard not to feel that shame that I stayed at that job longer, mm -hmm. <laughs> way longer than I should have. Mm -hmm. um, and so even with all those physical ailments, it wasn't until my aunt passed away, my mother's sister mm -hmm. passed away. Mm -hmm. And you know how grief works or bereavement. Mm -hmm. It only works with the people who are directly connected to you. Child. Well, ridiculous. 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 Yeah. Yes. And my aunts are like my second mothers. Like mm -hmm. there's no. That's that's my aunt, yes, by title, but like they are my elders. Mm -hmm. My boss would not le let me leave early to drive oh. to Philly that weekend for her funeral. And at that point I said, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. Like I, th yeah. I think for me, it was like, this is enough. This is yeah. not this is not allowing me to be a full person. I'm depressed. Mm -hmm. My body hurts all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm stressed out. Mm -hmm. I'm still broke. <laughs> like yeah. I can't, you're not paying me enough for this stress. Um, yeah. And it was celebrated if you put your body, your mind, your mm -hmm. being on the line for that job. Because I worked at a hospital. Also. Like slavery. It's like slavery. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Do you all remember like, I know, um, Dr. Kimani, you talked about like your moment where you're just like, I'm not doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, Marissa, do you know the moment or either one of you, like, where you just like, mm -hmm. this is it. Like, this is enough. I don't know what's going to happen. I just know that this is not it. Right. Like, mm -hmm. this is not it. And mm -hmm. before you left, this kind of like a, a A, B kind of question. <laughs> but before you left, was there were there any like fears that you had that like not trusting yourself, not trusting the future, feeling like. I don't know. I, I know I felt like a failure. Did you all feel that way at all? Anything that you all have to offer your experience? I'm willing to listen. Yeah, I'll say the the moment for me, I had to, uh, or I volunteered. I volunteered to sit on an interview panel because that was an issue for me, like as a recovering people pleaser, like saying yes to stuff I really don't want to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had volunteered to sit on an interview panel. Um, and one of the candidates was a black woman, right? And I had to mm -hmm. like withhold my experience of this place. Um, and it, it really hurt me physically mm -hmm. um, to lie about my experience, what I encountered there. Um, and I knew that I had to leave or else it was gonna like take me under, right? There was a point I was experiencing like suicidal ideation 
in this role. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I had to I had to make that decision to leave and preserve my life. Mm-hmm. Um, but fears, yeah, so many fears around money. Um, mm-hmm. Thankfully, I was able to start my business, Free Black Women Virtual Solutions, um, before I left. So I was able to pivot into that. But there were so many fears around, like, because I had tied my identity to the role as well, as well as the mission, mm-hmm. as well as the mission of, like, economic development, racial equity. All of these things were me, right? And I had to detach the mission that I was going after from me, because I'm me regardless of what I do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there were so many fears, so many fears that I navigated through. Yeah. yeah. And I and I just want to say, Marissa, I appreciate you sharing that um, on so many different levels, right? But just the importance of us recognize as Black women, a job is what we do, it's not who we are, it's not the core of who we are. The other part is that you, um, were very vulnerable and you admitted to having experienced suicidal ideation in relation to a job. And I appreciate that particularly because and we've talked about this, but Dr. Antoinette, Bonnie Kendia Bailey, and I think so many black women have seen what happened, right? Mm-hmm. And we're just heartbroken and we don't really talk about it. Prior to her passing, we have not talked about ways that Black women are really harmed in the workplace, the workplace bullying or other workplace traumas, and how that can significantly affect our physical and our mental health. And now we're saying we're very vocal in terms of we're very honest about how it's impacted us. And we're encouraging other Black women to connect to themselves as well and not lie to yourself. Don't say you got this or, you know, you're not going to run me out of here or whatever. If it's harming you, your priority needs to be you. Self-preservation comes before anything, any job. Okay. The other thing I want to say too um, is that stress, like you said, Alicia, stress is a killer, right? So when we think about stress, I've had black medical doctors on my channel um, and they've talked about, you know, weathering. So when you go through a lot of stress, particularly chronic stress, it causes your organs to age at a a faster rate. So you could be one age, but your organs are way older. And the American Heart Association is now coming out with research saying that black women are now dying at earlier ages because of racism, sexism, all these other external stresses. We need to pay attention to that. We also need to pay attention to black women and high profile positions, and we've seen it on LinkedIn, who have died suddenly. We have to take this very seriously. This is life or death for some of us. And it it hurts my heart. Let me just say this. I had a conversation with a Black woman recently, and she is still currently at that job, right? And actually, no, two conversations. And they're saying how horrible it still is, right? And I had to literally, when I was done talking to them, I said out loud, thank you, God, for saving me. Okay, thank you, God, for getting me out of there. But one of them talked about having a very serious mm-hmm. medical issue, very serious. And But she laughed about it. She laughed about it. And then she said she went to work the next day. And I am sitting here thinking, oh, my God. How do we reach Black women and let them know our health is the priority? I, yes, I, there's so much to what you all just said, both of you all. Um, This idea that our bodies, our being, our genius, our brilliance, our gifts belong to these employers, right? Like Mm -hmm. they really think that we are for rent. You know what I'm saying? Like, like there's- They own us. They own us yeah. and, 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 and they, they see any human experience that you may have as inconvenient mm-hmm. to, to their, their situation, whatever it is, mm-hmm. right? And with the exception of like emergency risk, like first responders, right? Or, mm-hmm. you know, people working in the hospital, nothing is ever really that serious. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not that serious, mm-hmm. but, but they are, they convince us mm-hmm. to believe that their mission, their thing is that serious, all forgetting um, that we are, sovereign human beings right. who, who were not put here to work. Like right. this whole thing is made up, right? Like right. this entire, like, and, and I know I'll be at the, uh, at the summit talking about dreaming and, and, and what we need to realize is that this is somebody's dream, yeah. right? 
And so this is somebody's made up existence. And, and I hope that people hear you all story and know that this is not the only option there is for them. Like this is, this is not a dead end. This mm-hmm. is not where you have to stay. Like mm-hmm. you, like you, Marissa, you say like, you're not a tree, right? You, you can get up, you have agency. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. yes. And it's like, it's so, it's so simple, but it really is like, no, actually I don't have to take this. Will it cost mm-hmm. me? Yes. Will mm-hmm. it take me time? Probably so, right? Mm-hmm. But there are things that we can do. Um, and, and and there's other please. ways for us to make money, right? Yes. So we know that we need to, most of us need to work to make money. We know that. What we're saying and what the virtual summit is providing information with is how to replace your income. That job is not the only place where you can get money. So if we're looking at the data, if you were able to get that job, what makes you think you can't get another job if you need to? Right. So there's other ways for us to make money. And I've heard this one, Alicia, so much, too. And I'm just like, oh, my God. Um, You know, I hate my job. I dread going there. But I'm a few years from retirement. And I'm like, girl, but you are barely making it. Do you think you're going to get to retirement? Like, come on, there's other ways for you to make money. Don't don't think that way. And there's other ways for you to deal with your health insurance and your retirement. We're going to talk about that during the summit, too. So Marissa and I were like, what are the main things that keep Black women at a toxic job? And how do we help support and provide the resources and teach you the how so you feel like you can detach yourself from that job, right? And like Stephanie said, these jobs are loyal. So why are we loyal to these jobs? Why are we loyal to these jobs? They they don't care about us, right? So we have to prioritize ourselves and say, wait a minute, I deserve better than this. I want more out of my life and I can do something different. I have options. I appreciate you sharing that. And and I agree with you. I I do want to, hi, Colette Elizabeth. Hello. Hello, Um, Friend of the channel, friend of multiple channels here, friend of everybody. I do want to read your comment. Um, During an appointment prior to leaving my toxic job, my eye doctor said my x-ray looked like I I had head trauma and asked me if I had been in an accident. When I said no, he asked if I was experiencing any type of stress. And this is, this is reaffirming, right? Like what Mm -hmm. you all were saying earlier, stress Mm -hmm. is a killer. Stress is a silent killer. Yeah. Um, a lot of us think like even there are things that my family says and I know that they don't. Um, yes, please, please put QQ next to your questions and we'll get to questions in a second. Um, but there are there are. Thank you, uh, Teton Beauty, by the way. I appreciate you. Um, there are there are ailments that some people have and things happen. Right. So let mm-hmm. me say this thing. People do get sick. Mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. But a lot of it, a lot of the things that we experience physically Mm-hmm. has to do with our stress level. Yeah. And it's it's like when you think about it, it's not just the job, right? It's driving to the job, right? It's driving in traffic. Girl, it's, the cost. Yes, the cost. The, the alarm goes off and you're like dreading like, oh my God. Yes. Ugh. From the time you wake up until your feet hit the door. Mm. And then even then, if you have children, then you're then you're giving your time to your children or your spouse or whatever other responsibilities you have. You might be caretaking, right? Mm-hmm. Like the stress, you never get a chance mm-hmm. to really catch it. Your robs your robs your like weekend, right? So yes. Sunday's scary. So yes. Sunday rolls around and you're like mortified. Like, oh my God, I gotta go back. And like what Marissa was saying, it creeps into your sleep, it comes into mm-hmm. your home. It affects your relationships with your family members, your friends. Everybody knows about people at the job, right? So it becomes this all-consuming thing that you feel like you can't get away from. And Alicia, I think what this was so challenging for many of us as Black women is we've been programmed so much as Black women. We're strong. We fight. Nobody you know, uh, runs us out of anywhere, right? We're not a punk, we're not weak. So then that, so we stay longer, right? And then let's add in the other part about people around us projecting their fears onto us. So we might have our own fears. Oh my God, what's going to happen if I leave? How am I going to make the money? Then you got your friends and family. Girl, that's a good job. You better not leave that job with those good benefits. Girl, you better not do that, right? And I'm gonna quote Glamazzini because I saw her. In the, I saw her. Don't pick, uh, check the tree before you pick the fruit, right? So if those people telling you that are not happy in their jobs, they've been miserable. Don't listen to them, okay? And be mindful of what information you share with people who tell you to stay in any situation where you're being harmed. You need to find a new community. Yes. 
I appreciate you sharing that. I hope that everyone's listening. I, I, I appreciate that. And I also say, if you all are watching the replay, hello, please check out the comment section, right? Like you're not alone. Like we've either all been there or we are there, right? And we're in this place where either we're like, and we're at different places. We might be at the place where just like, I don't really believe y'all, right? Like, I don't believe that that there could be better. I think that we are all put here to work hard and like working hard is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who are just like, I'm ready to leave but I don't have the coin. I don't have the vision. Like I don't have the access. Um, what would you say? I want to ask you all, what would you say to the person who is basically like on that one end of the spectrum where they say, you know what? I'm just going to grin and bear it. I'm just going to put in my how, how many, how, 40 plus years, mm. 50, 60, and maybe you'll be 80 by the time. Mm. Who knows when we, when it's time for us to retire using your quotes, but like, I'm going to muscle through and then just wait what would what would be something that you all would say to them? I would say, yeah, I'm, just, at, oh, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. go, on, Marissa, go on. Oh, no, I was going to say, like, your life is at stake. Like, it's that serious. It's it's life and death. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about how our bodies were down. And even as you've been sharing what you went through, I'm remembering, like, different health issues I've been through in college and past jobs, um, having back issues, too. Right. Having stomach issues and not being able to find the cause of it, having to go through all these procedures and stuff like that from stress. So stress wears on our body. Racial weathering is real weathering, period. Um, if you're in a job that is harming you. Um, so th those effects on your body, you can't get away from those. Mm -hmm. So I would just say, like, prioritize yourself and your health because you are far too important. Right. For you to suffer. Mm -hmm. Suffering is not something that you have to do. Mm -hmm. It's not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think as Black women to know we deserve better than to suffer and that our ancestors went through so much for us to be here right now. They don't want us to suffer. And you may not make it to retirement. If you're under that much stress, it is going to impact you. So when we talk about toxic jobs, we talk about toxic systems, it's poison. The poison is going to get into your system physically and or psychologically. So just think about, is it worth it? And Look at the Black women who we've lost, but also look at the Black women who have left and are doing well, okay? So all the Black women that we have on our summit roster, they left, they're doing well, okay? And you're learning from them, from other Black women who've left and are doing well. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, before, before you give your words of wisdom to the people who might be like, okay, I'm ready to take the plunge, but I don't know what first step to take. I do want to ask you all, because you're talking about the people who left their jobs, right? Mm -hmm. And now they're doing wonderful things. Mm -hmm. For you all, personally, what were you able to do that you weren't able to do before by being in those jobs? I know that I know that you all have created businesses, mm -hmm. which is which is great, right? And I do want to talk about that as well. But mm -hmm. I want to talk just like on a, on a, on a human level. Like when, when you all left that job, what were you able to do? How were you able to take up space and be in ways that you weren't able to be at the job? Like, could you breathe now? Mm -hmm. Maybe you were still stressed and worried, but like, what was the uh, effect from leaving those toxic places? Mm -hmm. I'll say, yeah, sleep. Sleep is like the first thing that comes up because I wasn't able to sleep for months, right? I would keep waking up in the middle of the night, like again, ruminating mm -hmm. about what I was going through. Um, playing out different scenarios in my head. So once I had that time away, I think it was like maybe a week that my body was recovering. Um, I was able to sleep after that for the first time. Um, eat, my appetite had gone away during this whole process. Um, so I was able to eat again. Um, like these are severe physical symptoms, right? Like stuff you need to survive that I wasn't able to do fully mm -hmm. in this role. Um, yeah, dream, dream again. Um, yeah, just go utilize my creativity, like I said, to start my business and also help other Black women build their businesses, um, rest, heal, all of these things that I couldn't do while I was in that toxic environment. Because like Dr. Kamani says, you can't heal while you're still in a toxic environment. Why are you being beat down? It's take to reopen that wound. It doesn't mm -hmm. have a chance to close. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True, true. And for me, um, I can honestly say since I left since I left that toxic job about two years ago, I never wake up in dread. Never. OK, 
towards the end when I was at the tie shop, I, every day I would wake up in dread, okay? Never, okay? Sundays, I don't feel the Sunday scaries. I'm happy a Sunday. I can fully enjoy a Sunday. And then physically, I'm getting healthier. My blood pressure is better. My hair is growing back because I didn't mention before my hair was falling out, right? My hair is growing back. I gained a lot of weight at that Tosca job. I'm getting my weight in order. So things are happening now for me. And I'm able to see that now I am able to affect change on a larger level, right? So, you know, sometimes I have these moments like, why this happened to me, <laughs> right? Like, why did I have a toxic job? Like, I was a good employee, you know, why I was dedicated to the work and all that other kind of stuff, right? But my Black woman therapist said, why not you? You are the one who always speaks up about stuff. So it was meant to be you. And so as I talk about my healing journey, I feel that it's liberating for me, right? It's, it's healing. It's liberating for me now that I've gone. And when I hear other Black women saying to me, they resonate with what I'm saying, then I feel such a sense of, you know, honor that I am able to support the healing of so many other Black women that I wasn't able to do with that toxic job. Right. So if I stayed there, first of all, I don't know how long I would have been. I don't know how long I would have survived. Right. But the other thing is I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. And so my mission now. Right. So I'm ushering in a movement to help as many black women as I can to leave and heal from toxic jobs. I wouldn't be doing that if I was still there. I again, that's that's lovely, because, again, going back to what we said, how our jobs they think they own a lot of us and a lot of our ideas. Some people can't even like create things because in their contract, they're saying that they own your IP. Like they mm -hmm. own your like, like, mm -hmm. like they, they own you, they own mm -hmm. everything. And I think that even when we talk about our jobs, how often are we talking about that job to our family and our oh. friends? Like it takes up so much space and like it leaves no room for us to be human, right? Yes. So even when I, when I left and somebody asked a question about unemployment, I'm gonna get to that in a second. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. Yes, it was scary being on unemployment and shameful, but I had peace. Like mm. I, I, I was poor. I'm going to, I'm going to call a thing a thing. I was poor, but I had peace. And I also mm. had the privilege of being able to live with my mother. So that's a whole mm. other thing. I know people have different circumstances, so it's not one size fit all. But mm -hmm. I, even though I was dealing with the shame and the weight of it, I was actually kind of grateful though, because I had time to actually consider mm. what do I want for myself? Mm -hmm. Like losing my job was a blessing in retrospect at the time it sucked, <laughs> but like I had time to be like, who am I? Mm -hmm. What do I really want to do? Like, mm -hmm. this is a pause that is forced, but it's a pause altogether. Right. Yeah. And I think um, the initial mm -hmm. shock happens, mm -hmm. but you know, I've interviewed a whole bunch of black women on my YouTube channel, a whole bunch. Not one of them have ever said, I regret leaving a toxic job. Not one, not one. I hope black women can watch those and be like, wait a minute. It's not just her. It's not just Marissa. It's not just Alicia. It's hundreds of black women who are like, I'm so thankful I left. It's it's showing you. I forget the person who said it. So excuse me. If you all would know the name, like possibility models, doctor. It's Dr. somebody. Dr. Joy Brad, the Brad Yes. yes right. okay. mm -hmm. Thank oh, you. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Like you all are showing us what is possible, right? You all are showing us, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, mm -hmm. but it seems like you all have at this point, even for this one event, not saying this has to be like your life's work for forever, mm -hmm. right? But for this event, you all's dream is to set other black women free. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Like, which is which is so interesting because you all and saying like these jobs, like you all have identity outside of this. You all have dreams outside of this. The job was just one vehicle for you all to do the work that you're doing. Right. Mm -hmm. But even now, that's the work that you're doing. You're setting people mm -hmm. free. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I just I, I geek because it's it's exciting to witness and to see um, and and how like our our dreams when we're younger, sometimes they change. Sometimes mm -hmm. we say, oh, oh, this was a dream for this many years or for this season. Mm -hmm. But like the heart of us usually is the same. And like the heart mm -hmm. wants to see people free. The heart wants to see yes. people liberated. Yes. Um, and whether that is through uh, psychology or social work or putting on an event, helping other black women, like leading black women. Somebody said it, 
modern day underground. Un yes, Leslin, thank you, thank you. Modern day underground railroad, period. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Um, when you, Dr. Kimani, when you said that somebody said to you, it had to be you, right? Mm -hmm. Because you spoke the truth. Mm -hmm. I, I think there is, Marissa, shout out to you, talking about being a truth teller, right? Like Marissa has talked about this. Mm -hmm. Like there are, I believe there are some people who have that fire in them to say something in whatever way they need to say mm -hmm. it. But mm -hmm. who are who have to be like, no, I have to call a thing a thing. Like, yeah. this is, what's going on? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> like, and I used to think that that, uh, that that something was wrong with me. Yes, right. Me too. I used to say, what is wrong with me? Like, I can't like I can see the game. I know how to play the game, but I cannot like if I know it's wrong, I cannot do it. I just can't do mm -hmm. it. And so now I'm like, no, that was a gift. There's not something wrong with you. That is a gift because you refuse to compromise your soul and you refuse to be complicit in your own oppression or the oppression of other people. So I embrace it now. I I love that you're embracing it. And I do think it's a superpower. Um, even like what, what Marissa was saying, agreeing with you, same, right? But mm -hmm. I also think there is something powerful because sometimes I feel like, like you said, like you feel like, oh, am I the only one? Mm -hmm. But the truth is you're not. You're never the only one, right? You just mm -hmm. might be the one brave enough mm -hmm. to say something about it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that it is a gift and it's a gift that everybody benefits from, right? Yeah. Like everybody mm -hmm. benefits from you fighting in whatever way. I hate saying mm -hmm. fighting because it sounds so violent and like aggressive. It's a struggle. Like, it is a yeah, struggle. It's a it's struggle. A fight. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fight. And, and in a fight too, Alicia, there's a cost. There's mm -hmm. a huge cost. Mm -hmm. So when I was out there fighting, people knew I was going to say something, right? They would look like, oh, she's going to say something because they knew I would say something, right? Mm -hmm. And just being out there by yourself, you would speak up and those people who want you to speak up, they're not there to support you. So the cost is that sometimes you lose a lot of people as you're out there advocating, as you're out there being attacked. A lot of people whom you thought might be there to support you, nowhere around. No. And and even with that, at the time, it can feel lonely. It can feel like, dang, ain't nobody had my back. But also, mm -hmm. like like you said, it comes at a cost. Everybody don't have the privilege to pay that cost. Mm. Everybody doesn't have the privilege of, of mm. being honest. And I like, like that. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So changing it from, oh, these are my, like, I don't know, not enemies, but, but you're not helping the cause. It's like, mm -hmm. no, like some people will come to you in private and in secret, like, oh, thank you. Thank you for sticking up and saying this or like, like that. I would get those examples like, oh, yeah, you know, I agree with you. And I'd be like, why you ain't say nothing? Mm -hmm. But <laughs> but I also understand that everybody doesn't have that same bravery or nor do they have the same privileges. Mm -hmm. So, so I appreciate y'all. Uh, I won't say taking my first Alicia, I'm sorry. Can I share an example? Because Please. you, oh my God, I have to share this example. Cause okay. So I was at this training and there was this uh, man doing the training. He was a therapist. His father was a therapist. He was showing us a video about his father doing this so-called paradoxical intervention. Right? So we're in this room um, there's only two black people in the room, me and another black woman. So he's showing this video of his father, who's not black. And uh, there's a black boy, a black boy in the, in the video. And so the therapist says to the black boy, um, how do you get to be so dumb? How do you get to be so stupid? Why are you so stupid? Right. And I'm sitting there mortified, like what in the world is going on here? Right. So I'm looking at my phone. The other black woman is texting me. She's like, I'm being triggered right now. I said, I am too. And I'm going to say something, right? So he keeps showing it. The mother in the video. So the boy's mother comes in. And so the therapist says to the mother, how did you raise such a dumb child? How did you do that, right? You know, he's going to end up in juvenile detention. And you know what happens to boys in juvenile detention, right? And I'm like, oh my God, like I'm literally just trying to just, right? So the video's over, the, the therapist is excited, the presenter is excited because he's like, oh, did you see the paradoxical intervention, right? So everybody's quiet, I raised my hand and I'm very calm. And I said, you know, that video was very offensive to show a young black boy and what was said to him given, and I just broke it down, like, right? And he's like, 
I told you to pay attention to the intervention. It's a paradoxical intervention. And I need you to pay attention to the intervention, right? And I said, I was. He said, and I said, but you need to look at the culture as well and ways that that's, he said, culture has nothing to do with it. I said, culture has everything to do with it, right? So then he comes back, he doubles down. So then he says, well, I showed this to a black man from the South and he thought this was a good intervention. I said, well, you know what? Some people struggle with internalized racism, but I'm just, and I said, I'm not going to go back and forth with you, right? So keep in mind, this is extra, everybody's watching this. Nobody says anything. We go out for break right after that. People are coming up to me. I'm so glad you said something. I'm so glad you said something. Not one person had my back. And guess what? The people that I work with, they had contracted with this man for supervision. And I was like, I'm not having supervision with this man. I'm not doing it. But that just shows you the mentality, right? That we were supposed to just sit and take that. And then how dare I say something and not getting not one, not even the other black woman, not one person came to support me at all. I'm just out there. So I had to say that because it, when you were talking, it just showed me again, they weren't able to speak up. They weren't able to, but I could not, I could not sit there and let that happen and not say anything to him. And I'm sure they, appre again, they did, obviously. They appreciated you. And I appreciate you um, sharing that. Somebody asked a question. I do want to, I'm going to start this and come back to this. Um, because that, again, those experiences can be infuriating, but it's like, they're afraid of retaliation. They're afraid mm -hmm. of whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, I've been very much like, I need a job, but I, I'm not, I'm not going to suffer at no job. I'm sorry. After I went, <laughs> after I went through that, I'm not doing that. I'll be uh -huh. broke. I've been, yeah. I've lost everything. And, and for me, I will lose everything again mm -hmm. before I give my life to an employer. And I don't know if that's a privileged thing to say. It might be, but like, mm -hmm. I, I am so okay with that and starting over because like you said, you can always get another job, right? You can yeah. always find some, even in between, mm -hmm. I know it, it don't pay that much, but it's like, mm -hmm. even if you have to work at fast food places until mm -hmm. you figure out what to do next, even if mm -hmm. like, there's always something else. Like, don't let mm -hmm. these people lie to you and tell you that this is all there is, mm -hmm. that this is all that will ever be, that these are your options because mm -hmm. they don't even know what all their options it's are. It's a control tactic. Yes. Yes. Here. Yes. Mm -hmm. ah. Okay. So as we start to move to the questions, if you have any questions, please put a cue in the question. I see I have a couple saved, but I do want to ask you all about your dreams now. Like now that mm -hmm. you are, I guess, like working through still healing mm -hmm. on the other side of a toxic job, at least. What mm -hmm. dreams do you either have for now or for the future? Um, mm -hmm. I do, if you want to talk about your, um, the summit now we can, but I'm also going to bring it up at the end. Um, but what dreams do you have for yourself now that you have this, like, it's kind of like blank slate, this blank page mm -hmm. of like, wow, now, now the future is mine. What is in the future for you all that you can foresee, at least for now? Hmm. As for me, um, traveling, traveling around the world, that's kind of always been my dream, um, and through Exodus Summit, I kind of had the, the tools now, because before I never thought it was really possible for me to be able to do that. Um, so yeah, just travel throughout the world. Um, I would love to grow my business and hire other Black women um, trained as virtual assistants so that more of us um, can get free from toxic jobs. Um, but yeah, yeah, just be happy. I feel like that's my ultimate dream, just be happy. Yes. And I just want to create the life that I want for myself. I don't dream of labor. I was that Stephanie who said that? I don't know who said that. I don't dream of labor. Okay. I've worked for a very long time and I do want to still work, but work in the way that I want to. I want to support Black women leaving and healing from toxic jobs. So if it's more summits, if it's coaching, whatever it is, I want to support Black women with liberation. And I want, and, and I think my biggest pain point right now is I hear so many black women saying, I can't leave. I can't leave. I can't leave. I got to stay. I, I'm too invested. I'm always to retire. So I'm trying to reach those black women too. Like how do I reach those black women also and letting them know and showing them a way out that you are able to leave. You are able to make money. You are able to do what you need to do about your retirement but don't 
delude yourself and thinking that you're not going to be harmed by you continuing to stay in that toxic environment. Don't delude yourself. Don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody thinks they can take it until they can't take it anymore. Right. Like sadly, our I mean, not sadly, in a good way, our bodies we might not listen to our bodies, but our bodies knows what's best for us and our bodies will mm -hmm. shut it down mm -hmm. if we don't, right? And we don't want to have to get to that place of being shut down. We want to be yeah. able to choose, right? Yeah. Like, so I love that. I love yeah. that. Um, I love, I love the answer. Be happy. I love the answer. Um, just like make life what you want to make it, right? Because when you reclaim yourself, like when you, when you, when you take back your time, I'm thinking about, of course. Reclaiming my time, but when you take back your time, yes. I see waters. <laughs> yes, yes, automatically. Yes. <laughs> but yes, when you reclaim your time, when you reclaim your peace, when you reclaim your health, like mm -hmm. when you reclaim your conversations, mm -hmm. like these, these white supremacy capitalism is so embedded into everything. It mm -hmm. even seeps into your dreams, right? Yes. When you are, when you're focused on, when you're in this situation, you can't even dream past your job. Like mm -hmm. just on a regular, like when you're talking about the weekend, a lot of us are stressed because Saturday is the only day. Friday you work, Sunday you're preparing to go to work. Saturday is the day that you get everything done. You go grocery mm -hmm. shopping, you you clean, mm -hmm. you do all these things. You have no time for yourself. You can't even dream. Like even for me, I had to unlearn that. Like every dream that I had, I had to figure out like, how do I make money from that? That's another trauma mm -hmm. for me. Like, how mm -hmm. do I make money from this? And like, dang, Alicia, do you have anything that you just do for fun for yourself? Do you have any hobbies? <laughs> Do you have any like personal interests? And I'm like, and also you don't have to, you don't have to monetize everything. Let me also say this, right? Like, mm -hmm. even if you want to start a business, sure. you don't have to monetize everything. Like you can mm -hmm. be free and create stuff for fun. Mm -hmm. Right. But we can also figure out what's next. Yeah. There, there are so many people on this, like in this summit that I am excited to witness and to listen to. Um, I put the link in the chat for, for you all if you want to check out um the summit. Um, but even people like Stephanie Perry, right? She has hacks, and I hate using that word, but she has figured out a way to live where she doesn't need so much money, mm -hmm. right, for housing and things like that with house sitting. Mm -hmm. There are so many options, y'all, right? Yes. There are so many options and people are showing you what is possible. And so this is always like nourishing to me because I love hearing people's stories. I love talking about people's stories and learning from people. So thank you both for sharing so much, like just being vulnerable with us about even mental health issues, about our physical health. Um, All these things are very generous to share with people listening. So I appreciate y'all a lot. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yes. Yes. Okay. Do we have a couple, do we have a couple of minutes for questions? Is that okay? I should have, I'm looking at the time like, oh. Oh yeah. So, okay. Okay. It's I don't want to hold y'all too long. Okay. <laughs> okay. I do want to bring up a couple of questions I saw. And again, if you have a question, please put QQ like, um, like this. Here we go. Hi, Gab Collins. Hello. Um, how could we approach our sisters slash black women in the workplace, including clients or leadership who are mm -hmm. work bullies? How mm -hmm. do we, how do we level set about the undue stress? And I don't have my glasses on the undue stress and emotional abuse professionally. Yes. So these, these are multiple questions. Um, oh, no, no. How, okay, I see what you, okay, excuse me. How could we approach our sisters or black women in the workplace, including clients or leaderships who are work bullies? How do we level set about the undue stress and emotional abuse professionally? Do any of you have any, either one of you have any thoughts about this question? You can try to set boundaries as much as possible with bullies. The problem is that bullies are protected by the system often. So I don't want you out here trying to fight, you know, right? So try to maintain boundaries as much as possible. But workplace bullies are dangerous, okay? Because you might think, oh, okay, I'm going to go report them to human resources and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. I'm going to do all these other things. It's rigged against you, okay? So when you recognize that this is a workplace bully, more than likely, that supervisor or supervisors know about it. If they don't check that workplace bully, that is a big red flag. That is not a safe environment in terms of psychological safety. So boundaries, yes, advocate for yourself. But also, I would say start making an exit plan to get out because it's not going to get any better. OK, and you might get really sick trying to prove things and expecting people to do things and they're not going to do it. OK. Um, how do we level set about the undue stress therapy? Okay. 
Therapy is very important for you to reality test about what's happening to you to get that toxicity out of your system. Um, and Marissa and I have both done videos about self gaslighting because when you're in the toxic environment, they're gaslighting you. What's dangerous is when you start self gaslighting yourself. So I would absolutely say therapy, particularly with a black woman therapist, if you're able to, but the other thing is you have to look at what is causing the stress. If the job is causing the stress, you need to start removing the source of the stress. So that means exit planning. Okay. So that's what the summit is about, helping you exit plan. It's it's okay. And make sure you, you travel in silence. You replan in silence. Don't tell your coworkers. Don't tell anybody at the job that you're exit planning because that can come back and get you. I was going to say HR. <laughs> That's a perfect. <laughs> yeah, a lot of us will go to HR with our concerns about these things, thinking that they're there to help us. They're there to protect the organization, the mm -hmm. company. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of us will fall into like a spiral once we realize that if we don't know that up front. Um, so that's very important to realize that HR is not there to protect you. They're there to protect the company. Um, mm -hmm. So if you do go there like seeking support, you're not going to receive what what you actually need. Mm -hmm. right? And if you try to make logical sense of it, I've had so many clients, my therapy clients say this to me and they're like, but it doesn't make logical sense. And I remember even when I was in the situation, it doesn't make logical sense. It's not going to make logical sense because you don't know all the dynamics going on. You don't know who's connected to whom. You don't even know all that stuff. And it's not even worth it. When you start recognizing what's happening, then again, you need to start thinking, okay, is this the place for me? And what are my options to get out of here? Because it's not going to get better. I'm telling you, I know it's not going to get better because I'm still talking to people who still at the toxic job. They tell me it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. I appreciate y'all sharing that. And also, I also want to um, mention that I would love for you to talk about this too, mm -hmm. for people that might have prying eyes, right? Sadly, mm -hmm. there are some jobs that monitor their employees and where mm -hmm. they are. Um, mm -hmm. And I love that you all are having um, a feature where people don't have to show their face or their name. Can mm -hmm. you talk about like why that's important? Because I thought that was so dope. But yes, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you said, there's a lot of employers that will spy on us, unfortunately, similar to a plantation system, mm -hmm. right? So we created this summit. Um, no participant cameras will be allowed. And you'll also have the option to change your name within the summit platform. So you can just participate like anonymously mm -hmm. if you want to. Um, but we added that privacy protection because we realized that's real. Even mm -hmm. though it's not right, like they do, they are out here spying on us, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then just as black women, like we just might just want to keep our business to ourselves too, right? So we might mm -hmm. not have that employer, but we just, we don't want people in our business. So don't let concerns about people finding out what you're doing, keeping you from registering for the Job Liberation Virtual Summit for Black Women, May 18th and 19th. I, I appreciate that. And, and I agree, like money, finances, employment, all these things are very personal, right? And yeah. and they are personal and they're where, where, where we spend most of our day at, right? Like these are very, these are very personal experiences. So you all protecting like people and their privacy is really, really important, especially mm -hmm. as black women. So I appreciate y'all yeah. saying that. Um, Tea Time Beauty says, everybody's an op until proven innocent, period. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, yes. <laughs> yes. Literally, that's how I move at my jobs. Like when I when I was employed, I don't I have to learn who, who are you connected to, right? First of all, yes. I'm not talking about nobody. Don't ask me nothing, don't include me. I'm not interested. Yeah. But if we if we do become cool, you do realize, like you said, that even though these people might not be on the same level as each other, mm -hmm. there might be someone who is above you, but then like preferring somebody else, right? So you mm -hmm. think that you have an ally even in your coworker, mm -hmm. and you might not. Yeah. So just I'm, be oh, careful. Sorry. No, I remember something uh, Colette Elizabeth said, you know, she was a manager, a high ranking manager. And she was saying that the vast majority she would of the time she would find out about something that an employee was doing was from their so-called work buddy, their so-called work bestie. So I completely agree. And, and part of my healing has been, <laughs> yeah, everybody's an op. Part of my healing has been too dealing with the betrayal of people mm -hmm. that I trusted in the workplace mm -hmm. who
who betrayed me. And so I definitely say, be mindful of who you share information with and what you share information about. That's what I'm saying. Don't tell anybody about your exit planning at the job. Don't do that. Thank you both for sharing that. I appreciate that. And I agree. Please don't. If you if you don't have to, please. <laughs> um, let's see. Because even, and I'm just going to say this as an aside, in abusive relationships, even in romantic abusive relationships, right? A lot. One of the most dangerous times is when one partner is leaving, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so even if you're leaving a dangerous job or a toxic job, excuse me, it's still dangerous, right? They yeah. might not put hands on you, but they might bully you. They mm -hmm. might, they might bully you. They might, you know, treat you. More. Yes. Like just as you're exiting, like try to drag you down and leave mm -hmm. you with nothing. Um, mm -hmm. So just, just be mindful and thoughtful about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Lexi K says, oh, how can people find the courage to stand up? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. like, so I'm guessing against like bosses, coworkers, the job itself. Mm -hmm. um, several things. One, again, therapy. Also, who are the people that you surround yourself with? Are they pouring into you? Are you able to seek support from them? Or are they telling you to just stick it out? All jobs are like that. It's better to say the devil you know than the devil you don't know. Just put your head down, stay out the business. Like that's not helpful. So if people are seeing what's happening to you, you're able to talk to them. But I would say therapy more so because that's an objective person who can reality test with you, who can validate with you, and can also help support you as you are exit planning. So that person, that therapist is partnering with you through that process to help support you in terms of becoming courageous enough to get ready to go. And oh, well, let me say something. I'm sorry. I have to say something. So you have to recognize when you're in a toxic job that you can stand up, you can, you know, set boundaries, you can do all these things. Also recognize that there's a cost involved with that. So you have to weigh the benefits and the cost to you standing up, or do you want to use that energy and, and focus that energy on trying to find someplace else that's not as toxic? So that's something that you need to weigh out possibly in therapy. Thank you for adding that because it does cost. It does yeah. cost. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right. The next question I have is, uh, did anyone see the video of career day at an elementary school? All the white kids had professional jobs and the one black girl they showed was a cashier in a grocery store at a private school. I did not see that. And I thank God I did not see that because that would have that would have made me angry. Wow. <laughs> that would have made me upset. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it it go it kind of goes to show you this is like a small example. I used to work for McDonald's, and at this job, one of my managers told me that basically she gave me all the brunt work because I she was a white manager also I should say. So she gave me all the brunt work because she said, "Oh well, you're tall, right? Like mm -hmm. you're tall, so you're strong." Um, what? I was you know I was 16 at the time, and again I had no real lived experience of of mm -hmm. racism at that point. Mm -hmm. But like when I look back, it's like, oh, you because I'm a tall black woman, you give me the nasty work. You wow. give me the heavy things. And so like all of this, it what we're talking about, this example at the uh, career day is like we even children, even little little baby black girls, like we mm -hmm. see them. We see them as the help. We see them as the ones. <laughs> mm. And, and this is the thing. There's nothing also wrong with being cashier. I think mm -hmm. that no matter what job you're in, McDonald's mm -hmm. or the boardroom, we mm -hmm. should all be, be paid a livable, mm -hmm. a livable wage with benefits mm -hmm. and all these because they have the money. Right. Mm -hmm. So please don't mistake me. Mm -hmm. But they put a cap on where black people, black women specifically can go, what kind of mm -hmm. positions they can be in, even in their mind. Mm -hmm. um, so that's you know, this is an example mm -hmm. of the spirit murder of our kids. This is an example of that, how it happens in the schools and how they have certain images of who you are and who you can be. So, right, there's a range of different professions that we can have. We're not saying anything less about being a cashier, but are you having a balanced perspective? But the fact that all the white kids have professional jobs and you have that, that's an example of spirit murder. And so we have to be very mindful of ways that spirit murder happens even in the schools, 
all the way up to our jobs. We have to be very mindful of that. Spirit murder. Oh, that is, that's heavy and that's deep. Uh, yes. Anybody else want to say anything? I'm going to go to the next question. Um, oh, thank you also the educator and Lexi K and Gab Collins. Um, peace be within her. Love that name. Peace be within her. Love I that love name. That. Yes. Um, I work in a production-based job and I feel I'm overworking myself. How can I dial it back and still do my job but not feel like I'm overworking myself? Ooh, production-based. Hmm. I, I, I'll let you all, if you want, okay. Cause I was going to say like, if it's production based, mm -hmm. that's hard, right? Because it's like, mm -hmm. again, I hate going back to enslavement, right? But it's the same as like, oh, we're all expected to pick this much cotton, this much rice, mm -hmm. whatever, like at the end of the day. And if you're not meeting that mark, right, then you are somehow, I don't know, punished in whatever way that they, they want to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm always going to be like, use your talents in a place that is that respects you and that is kind to you. So I'm always going to say like, opt out. And I'm also always going to be like, do as little as possible at these jobs, right? Shout out to Stephanie Perry. But mm -hmm. if your job is in, is in danger of being lost because it's not meaning production, then I honestly, I can't speak too much to that because I'm just going to leave. Like if, mm -hmm. if it's too much for me, I'm like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to exhaust myself to try to get that. But does anybody else have anything else to offer? Because I feel like. I wasn't really helpful. Yeah. You want to say something, Marissa? No, I was going to say do the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, if there are those production goals that you can't reach, like you're pushing your body past the brink of exhaustion trying to meet these, then I would look for another option because you don't deserve to be treated like that. They mm -hmm. are trying to run you into the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're socialized as like machines mm -hmm. in the society. Um, so, yeah. No, yeah. What you shared with yeah. was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say also think about it as the nature of the work, right? So it, it's inherently a lot of work anyway. So think about, okay, maybe short term, I'm going to try to do what I can do, right? But I also encourage you to think about what are the things that you are getting rest? What are the ways you're replenishing yourself? Because you have to get rest as well, okay? Now, the short term might be, okay, I'm going to stick it out for two more months, I, I stack my cash and then I'm out of here. Okay. So start thinking about maybe a short term exit plan and you might pivot to something else, not like a dream job, but something that's just going to make you some money as a short term exit plan strategy. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, thank you. Thank you both for that. Because like you said, even if it is like, okay, let me go to, if, if this is possible, let mm -hmm. me consider somewhere else that I can go to, even if it's not even using the skills that you have, but you're able to be employed there and it's mm -hmm. less stress mm -hmm. and less trauma mm -hmm. <laughs> and, a, and a lesser pace, by all means, because mm -hmm. if your job is lesser pace and less demanding, that still gives you more room in your mind, in your body, even mm -hmm. to be human, to be a full yeah. human and be able to figure out what your next plan is. Yeah. Right? And then you have data, mm -hmm. but when you look for your next jobs, what questions to ask, right? So what is the workload here? What is the expectation? What are the work hours? What are the breaks? So you can use this as a lesson as you go to another job. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much. Peace, peace be within her. Um, and I agree with you, Dr. Kimon. I think like my friend Alexis said, everything is compost, right? Nothing in life is wasted. Even the time that you spend at the job, right? There's a lot of times we feel like, oh, I wasted my life. And I felt that way before. And I realized mm -hmm. like, no, life happens in chapters, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to keep doing the same thing for the rest of your life. This is just the ending of a chapter. And it was, mm -hmm. and we can get something beautiful from that too. Like mm -hmm. every bad situation, we can get something mm -hmm. for ourselves from that. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, hi, pretty princess. I love that name. Um, honestly, as someone who used to, oh, honestly, oh, this, I wanted to highlight this because they said this. Honestly, as someone who used to work at a toxic work, workplace, I stopped applying to the jobs I knew I would hate and started mm -hmm. setting boundaries. Also, working from home has helped a lot. So Good. thank you so much, pretty princess, for sharing that. Yes. Yes. Because that's that's important, too, because I'd be I, when I was desperate for a job, I'd be like, well, I don't want to do this, but I can. Mm. But long, that's not a long term plan. Mm -mm. That's, that's not a, a long term plan. Mm -mm. I don't want any of us to settle, right? It's like, oh, I can do this, but I can. Yeah, you can, but why? Why settle? Yeah. Why? yeah. I love that. Oh, I love that. 
Hi, Ty. Ty, oh, hello, hello. Um, I'm going to attend the summit, but how do I resign from a job gracefully without burning bridges? I have so much anxiety around leaving. Okay, love this question because even though I be leaving, I be scared, okay? I be mm -hmm. like, I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. I don't mm -hmm. want to rock the boat. I also don't want retaliation for these mm -hmm. last two weeks that I'm here. So mm -hmm. yeah, so how do you resign from a job gracefully without burning bridges? Yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, so you can focus on your resigning because of other opportunities. You don't have to call out everything that happened at the job. You don't have to call people out, right? So let them know, give them a notice, give enough time if you're able to do so. Now, I left immediately, right? So I guess I burned some bridges. I don't even care. I don't want those bridges, okay? But if you are in a situation where you want to still, you know, maintain relationships, just, you know, I am leaving this job, effective, blah, 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 to pursue other opportunities. Just keep it short and sweet. And if people start asking you in the workplace, be mindful of people prying in the workplace. Just keep repeating the same story, right? They're going to try to get in your business. Just repeat the same story. They don't. You don't owe them any more than that. And the anxiety, we're going to talk about that during the summit too, okay? How to address the anxiety and the fears and all of that because I remember that. It, it's a lot. Okay, so we're going to talk about that during the summit too. I'm Thank glad you for coming. sharing that. Yes, yes, so exciting. I just, yeah, I was just going to say, like, that's something I had to learn too that I didn't know anyone an explanation for leaving. Mm -hmm. You don't, right? You're employed free will. So you can leave anytime you want to. A lot of us, again, have our identities tied to these jobs. So it feels mm -hmm. like impossible to leave. Mm -hmm. But once you detach that, it's like you realize it's no, you're free to go anywhere. Just like you got that job, you can go to a different job. That's something I had to learn too. Mm -hmm. I love that. Again, your wisdom, you're not stuck, right? You're not stuck in this one place. Like you have options. Um, and, and I, and I do, <laughs> that's funny. Hi, Themis. <laughs> this was cute. Now it's not. <laughs> I, was just him. I was just watching you. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> But hello, everyone that's come in. Hello, hello. Hi, Angie. I'm glad that you're enjoying the stream. And I saw a lotus flower. Hi, beautiful people. I hope that you're enjoying this. Uh, these women are sharing gems and I'm, I'm appreciative. I'm appreciative. Um, I also, without burning bridges, right? Sometimes I also want to say as someone who has left jobs, sometimes you can't help the bridges that are burned, right? Sometimes they burn them for you. Um, and even as a recovering people pleaser, you can do everything in your power to be, you know, kind and thoughtful and Oh, I'll train, you know, if you want, uh, but I'll train the next person coming up in my position, like depending on how far you want to go. Right. But sometimes they still re will resent you. Sometimes they still will talk down about you, talk bad about you. Sometimes they still will talk down to you. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's not what I had to unplug from was like, these people are not my family. Mm -hmm. These people are not my Ooh. friends. <laughs> like These oh, people yeah. don't yeah. honestly really care about me. These mm -hmm. like, and I'm in the, co some coworkers I met, they were very kind, but even then there was only up to a certain point that we mm -hmm. were friendly and kind. Mm -hmm. I'm here to make money mm -hmm. and to go home mm -hmm. with my, with my good health, my right mind. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, it's nothing personal, but it is personal, right? Like yeah. I'm leaving not because I hate you, but I'm leaving because I love myself. Yeah. You know so yes. like, so I think that sometimes we have to eat it because some people will be mad, but at the mm -hmm. same time, We'll work through it. And in two years, we won't even be thinking about that person. Or Exactly. And, <laughs> yeah. and know that if you establish really good relationships with people at the job and they respect you, they will still be connected to you. I'm still connected to a number of people at the old job who respect my work. I respect their work. So sometimes you need to cut, I would say, like weeds, right? You need to cut the weeds out of your life sometimes because they're going to cut. They're not going to allow you to grow. And they're going to hinder you. So sometimes you need to cut the weeds sometimes. I love that. The weeds. Because even weeds, like weeds are weeds because it takes the energy from plants, right? Yeah. Like it, it, feasts, it feasts off of other plants. It makes other plants unwell. If your job mm -hmm. is sucking the life out of you and the energy, it is a weed. It is, it is, it is something that is like, it's a parasite, right? Ooh. Like it's draining you. Um, and they, they'll never be satisfied. They won't be satisfied. And after they suck you dry, they'll move on to the next push person. Mm. Put your position online the next day. Mm. Send yeah. a little condolence email and move on. You know what I'm saying? Like you're you're worth so much more than your job. You're worth so much more than your job. Um, let's see. Oh, um, hummingbird. Hello, hummingbird. Um, question: Time of the summit in which state? 
So the summit is online. Yes, right. Yeah. So yes. So I'm gonna put the link here in the chat. It is May 18th and 19th. Let me paste. I'm trying to do two things at one time. From one 12 second. to 6 p.m. Pacific time. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you. But yes, so hopefully if you're able to come, please come. Please come. It'll be great. It'll be great. Um, pretty uh pretty princess says something. Um, write down what you what you want from a job. I did that last year and that changed my life. I did not want to repeat the cycle working customer service jobs that I hated. I hated. I love that, pretty princess. Thank you so much for sharing that. These are just people that I saw like, yes, yes. Um, hi, us uh, hi, Sand NYC. Hello. There you go. Stop settling. From a conversation we were having earlier, a part we we're talking about not settling for what you can get, but for what you really want. Like, what do you really want? Exactly. Centering yourself. Because yes. somebody said earlier in the chat, like when you're being interviewed, sorry if I missed it, but when you're being interviewed, you're interviewing other people as well. You're interviewing that job too, to mm -hmm. see if that job is a good fit for you. Like mm -hmm. you're not just here for them. They're here for you. They're the exactly. ones, they're your patrons, right? They're the ones paying you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're the ones allowing you to do, you know, live. Yeah. And so you want to make sure that this is a, uh, what is this? Like reciprocal relationship. Like there's reciprocity in some way. There's something that I'm gaining from this relationship and you're gaining from me, me, because I'm amazing, right? I'm going to yeah. show up and do my job, but you're not going to play me. So. No, no. <laughs> so and yes. we don't want you to end up in another toxic job. So you need to interview. You need to look at what's on Indeed, what's on Glassdoor, what's, what are people saying about working at this place? So you don't end up in another toxic job and feel so demoralized. Yeah. Yes. I um I love this. I love this conversation. And as we start to wind down, I do want to ask you all for the people who are ready to make the leap, for the people who are at that precipice where they're like, that I'm at the end of my rope. I like I can't do this anymore. I don't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. What do you have to offer? as in the summit, but also for both of you all, you both work with um, work with folks and mm -hmm. you also share wisdom on your own channels and things like that. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say to people who are like, I'm ready to go. I know I'm at my limit, but I don't know what to do next. Mm -hmm. Like, what would you say to them? Mm -hmm. I would say to prepare for the fear because a lot of times we'll, we feel like fear means stay where you are, even if you're being harmed. So the more that you can prepare for those feelings of fear to pop up, and know that you have everything it takes to move with it. Mm -hmm. I think that's powerful. It doesn't mean stay. It just means this is new. This is new what you're going towards, um, but you have what it takes to, to keep going. Um, and at the summit, we have all sessions on like start your own business. Dr. Kamani and I are gonna be leading a session, how to utilize your existing skill set to start a business. Because a lot of us feel like we have to go out and get more credentials, more degrees to start a business. But both of us have, started businesses using our skill set that we've gained over our careers. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be leading a session on that. Um, and yeah, how to get remote work, contract work, if that is something you want to do as well. Um, but know that you don't have to stay somewhere you're being harmed. Yeah. I think that's like the bottom line. A lot of us feel like we do, but you don't. Mm -hmm. You have options. You have options. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think that the first thing is to congratulate yourself and connecting with yourself and recognizing this is not working for me. So first say, wow, I'm proud of myself. I'm honoring myself. Pause and say, okay, sit with yourself and think about what is it that you want for yourself, right? And if you're stuck, there's resources for you. So there's a Job Liberation Virtual Summit for Black Women, May 18th and 19th. So as Marissa just said, there's so many things that we're going to talk about in terms of addressing those mental roadblocks that might keep you at the job, the fears, anxiety. So Stephanie Perry is kicking it off with Job Detox. We're also going to be talking about some of the experiences you may be having at the top job. Burnout, ways it might impact your mental health, how it might impact your sleep. And then Alicia is going to be talking about ways to connect to your joy, your dreams, your creativity. Because when you think about being in a toxic job, it can rob you of your joy. It can rob you of all those things. Many times it's a soul sucking experience. Okay. So that's day one. Day two is more of the practical in terms of what you need to do now. So talking about anti, um, the anti-HR, HR lady, Emery Archer is going to be talking about discrimination, 
severance issues, if that's what's going on at your job. Libria Jones is going to be talking about um, remote work, uh, contract work. Uh, freelance work, right? And then we got Patrice talking about um, side hustles and then Marissa and I talking about creating your own business, okay? And then we're going to finish it off with Dr. Roche Brown, a financial financial psychologist whom I work with to get my money right so I can leave to talk about how do you get your financial plan in order? And if you want to upgrade your ticket, the following day, you have more time with Dr. Roche Brown particularly if you're trying to leave within the next six months to a year and really getting your financial plan in order. Okay. So I would say, I also light up. I love it. Yes. So check out the summit, check out the summit that is available to you right now. Early registration ends tomorrow. Okay. So get your ticket today. So you don't have to spend any extra money. Okay. So early registration again, ends tomorrow. And the registration link is right there in the description section. Thank you for showing this. And we have wonderful sponsors who are all black owned, black black women owned sponsors as well. I thought that was dope. I thought that was dope. I was like, yes, come on, black woman owned sponsors. Yes. yes. <laughs> there, there is another question in the chat from Mara. Hello, Mara. Mara asks, is there a replay option? Yes. Do you want to talk about that, Marissa? Yeah, for the premium pass, there you will get access to the replays after the summit, as well as the exclusive access pass, which will give you that um, kind of more individualized time with Dr. Roche on the Monday following the summit. So those two passes will give you access to the replays. Mm -hmm. That's awesome and thoughtful. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for spending time with us, for being so generous with us. I, um, I'm inspired. I'm really excited because I wish that I had these resources available for me at this point, 10 years ago, 10, eight, eight years ago. I wish I had these resources actually before then. I wish that I had this before I even went into the workplace, right? <laughs> because yeah. I didn't, right. Like I didn't know, I didn't know what to, what to expect or what mm -hmm. to ask or mm -hmm. even how to leave a job, how to advocate for myself, mm -hmm. even with the FMLA that I had to get on for my depression. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know about the resource, um, but I think my mother told me, right? So they're they're not they're not telling you all the things that are available to you. You kind of have to like flail around a little bit and trying to figure yeah. out yourself, which is very yeah. frustrating. Yeah. Um, so sure. yes, yes. And that's on purpose, right? That's by design. Exactly. So information deliberately so that you don't exactly. know. Exactly. Uh -huh. Ooh, someone asks, and Themis asks, <gasps> how does one become a sponsor? <laughs> Wow. Does that mean you want to become a sponsor? Listen. Because that would make us so happy. Oh, yay. Because yeah. I watch your show. <laughs> I was literally just watching it today. Aww. That's that perfect. would be awesome. Yes, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Should I? I will. Is there an email or that you would yeah. prefer to? Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can email support at lipsing as we climb consulting.com. Okay. That is awesome. I'm going to type in, talk at the same time. Lifting Thank as you so much. Climb. Dot com. Consulting.com. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not a good typer, y'all. But here we are. It is. No, let me take it back. <laughs> let me stop. Because I, I keep saying this. Okay. It never happened. It never happened. <laughs> Hi, Kenny. Hello. Hello. Hummingbird says, thank you, Alicia and guests, giving you your flowers at this present moment. Bless you. Thank you. Grateful for your platform reflecting our collective healing. Rise up. And I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. I think that is a, oh, let me press in. I think that is a lovely place to end. I really appreciate you all being here. I wasn't able to, to notice every single comment, but I'm going to go back and rewatch and, and read the comments. And for those who are watching the replay, please check out the comment section because, or the chat because there are resources in there. There are ideas in there. There are other people's experiences in there. You're not alone. You're not alone. At some point, everyone that you see on the screen has either been in a toxic job, has also survived it, right? Like, so there is life on the other side of this. There is hope. There are dreams. There is happiness. We talked yeah. about that earlier. There's happiness waiting for you on the other side of this. Like, you don't have to suffer just to make a check. You don't. Yeah. yeah. You don't. And these people are here to show you how. So 
how not to suffer. <laughs> so thank you all for being here. And how to I do, thrive. And how to thrive. How to right? thrive. We want to do yes. more than survive. We want to thrive in our lives. Yes, we deserve yes. that. Yes, I love that. So as we close, is there anything top of mind or anything that you all want to leave us with or any thoughts or again, any thoughts for yourself or anything that you want to share with the chat? Please do. Please do. Um, yeah, just, I just want to thank y'all both, right? Coming across your YouTube channels has like changed my life. Uh, Dr. Kamani's channel made me realize that I was in a toxic job in the first place because this, um, what I was going through was so isolating and I didn't have anyone around me that really understood what I was going through. And then Alicia, your channel, of course, um, just seeing you share your story so openly um, encouraged me to do the same. So just give me both your flowers. Thank you. Yes. And I appreciate both of you as well. I feel blessed to know both of you. and. I hope that Black women are able to see that through our experience that we are exemplifying and modeling post-traumatic growth. We have gone through trauma and we are growing and we are thriving following the trauma and you can do that too. You may not believe it, but my hope is that you see us as an example of that and that you see the summit as a resource for you so that we're walking with you. We may not know you, but we're walking with you, it's all Black women walking with you, sis, to support you in this healing journey, okay? There are resources available to you, but you have to be open to accessing the resources, right? You might say, oh, I can't afford it, I can't. Well, it's, it's less than the price of getting your hair done, okay? So you can, right? You can. It's prioritizing yourself and knowing that you deserve better because you do. Because you do, not because you suffered, not because you worked hard. You deserve goodness, period. There's no qualification for that. You deserve goodness. You were put here for goodness. Um, I have, and thank you both. <laughs> I put um, Marissa's channel and Dr. Kimani's channel in the chat, y'all. So please check them out. They are an amazing resource. Both. Both people are an amazing resource. Please check out their channel if you have more questions about Pet to Threat or any other thing that they talk. They talk a lot about that on their channels. And they have uh, influenced, encouraged, and taught me. And so I ask that you please tap into our sisters as a resource because that's what we're here for, right? So thank you all for having uh, having the time. <laughs> thank you for sharing with us. I keep wrapped, I wrapped up like three times, but I'm grateful. <laughs> I'm grateful that y'all are here. <laughs> and you. I am giving both of you all your flowers. You all have helped me immensely. I, you, even just by sharing your story and making me feel like I'm not alone. Like, I'm not crazy. I'm not making this up. This is not in my head. That yeah. does a lot for me. Yeah. So. And I want to thank you too, Alicia. You know, I told Alicia earlier, I wore this shirt for her, Speak Your Truth, because she speaks her truth. And you model that for so many other Black women. And to me, Alicia, when I see your videos, I feel like you radiate joy. I love watching your videos. So thank you. And I want to support you in continuing to do so. You are supporting the healing of so many of us. Because so many of us as Black women, we've been beat down so much that we believe that we don't even have able, we're not even able to access joy. And I think by seeing you and seeing you talk about it and by you walking in your joy, you are inspiring other Black women to do so too. So I want to support you and to continue to do so. Thank y'all so much. I'm like blushing so much. I might cry. I appreciate you. all I do. It's a love fest. And this is what sisterhood is about. This is what it's about. <laughs> like this. Yes. Uh, so shout out to both of you all leading, like listening to spirit, listening to your, listening to your gut, your intuition, your heart to go back and get those who are still behind, right? Mm -hmm. Like who are, who are left behind, who might not know the way out. Mm -hmm. The Harriet Tubman's, right? The Underground Railroad. I love that. I love that. Um, and I love that you all, this is something we didn't talk about, but as we're closing, Harriet Tubman freed herself first, right? Like she, yes. she got free first and she came back mm -hmm. multiple times, but she came back mm -hmm. after she found her freedom, found her way. Mm -hmm. And she didn't withhold that. She shared that. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are supposed to, when we get our freedom, we share it. Exactly. We share the way out. So exactly. kudos to both of you. And I appreciate y'all so much. So. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm going to end the live stream. If y'all could pop, stay with me for one second. Thank you all. Have a wonderful mm -hmm. evening. Shout out to the moderators. Thank you for keeping us safe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. All right. Have a good evening. Bye, everyone. Bye.